Hello and welcome back to the live reading of Alone on the Wall by Alex Honnold with David Roberts. If you're not caught up, I just want to remind you to go ahead and listen to the previous episodes to get yourself up to speed. But uh, today we're going to finish chapter four, right? Are we on chapter four? I know what you're thinking. I, I, I know what you're thinking. This guy's reading the book. He doesn't even know what chapter he's on. What kind of Gumby trash am I listening to right now? Chapter four, that's exactly what I said. You doubted me even. Uh, it's a it's a rainy day here in Southern California. It's been gloomy and rainy all day, so you may hear some rain sounds outside. But I figured we'd just go full, like balls deep into the ASMR vibe that we've created, anyways. Let me even let me even zoom the camera out for you just a little bit. You may even catch catch a glimpse of the cat on my lap. I hope she doesn't leave because it's warm. But let's get going. Mark had discovered the Aneti Desert by staring hard at satellite photos. On a previous expedition to Cameroon, he started wondering about the climbing possibilities in Chad, which borders Cameroon on the northeast. Civil war in the Sudan had provoked a refugee crisis in Chad, making it an inhospitable country for Westerners to visit, but Mark loves that sort of challenge. He knew that expeditions had been active in the Tibesti Mountains, near the northern border of Chad, but the much more remote Aneti seemed untouched by climbers and the satellite photos made it clear that the rock formations there were spectacular. For his team, Mark put together two threesomes. What a, what a guy, Mark, Jesus. What he called his media team, whose main mission was to film and photograph, even though all three were good climbers, consisted of Jimmy Chin, Renan Ozturk, and Tim Kempel. The quote-unquote climbing team was Mark, James Pearson, and myself. James is a Brit who'd made quite a splash on the gridstone crags of his native country, then had taken his act abroad. He was about the same age as me. I'd climbed with James for a day or two in the UK, but I didn't really know him. I sensed, though, that his outlook on climbing matched mine a lot better than the old-school mountaineers I'd gone to Borneo with. By 2010, like me, he was sponsored by the North Face. Dude, everybody's sponsored by the North Face. The North Face, sponsor me. I'm waiting. Sparsely inhabited today, the Aneti had once been a thriving homeland to semi-nomadic pastoralists who herded everything from ghosts, cattle, to camels. From goats? I said ghosts. Th these guys herded ghosts. They herded goats and cattle to camels. The vivid rock art of the region, pictographs painted in red, white, brown, and black, was first discovered in the 1930s. The human figures abound in archers leaping and dancing as they carry their bows. By now, archaeologists have been able to use the rock art to date and define a series of cultures ranging all the way back to 5000 BC. We arrived in N'Djamena, Chad's capital, I apologize if I'm butchering that, but you try and read that, in mid-November. One thing Mark is really good at is arranging logistics in developing countries. For our excursion, he had recruited an Italian expat named Piero Rava, who at the age of 66 ran a trekking company taking foreigners on ambitious photo tours of places like the Aneti. Piero was a veteran mountaineer himself, having participated in a bold Italian expedition at Cerro Torre in Patagonia in 1970. An amazing spire of granite and ice, Cerro Torre had once earned the reputation as the world's most difficult mountain. Another Italian, Cesare Maestri, claimed to have reached the summit in 1959 only to have his partner, the Australian Tony Egger, die on the descent when he was avalanched off the wall. Other climbers doubted the ascent, and it is now generally regarded as a complete hoax, with Maestri and Egger getting nowhere near the top. The Italian team in 1970 got to within 200 meters of the summit. Had they succeeded, they would have claimed the true first ascent, which was finally pulled off four years later by a team led by Casimiro Ferrari, who had been Piero's teammate in 1970. It was cool to have a Cerro Torre veteran leading our expedition, and even cooler to know that Piero had 15 years of experience in taking trekkers to the Aneti. He had checked out lines on the arches and pinnacles, but he hadn't climbed anything, and he assured us that no other climbers had touched the rock there. Piero spoke almost no English but good French, so I ended up translating for the crew in the jeep. The whole process was kind of fun. Borneo had been my first taste of a true third world adventure, but Chad was far more intense and the impact on me of those three weeks in Africa would be life-changing, in ways I never could have foreseen. We set off from N'Djamena in a Land Rover and a pair of Toyota Land Cruisers. The Aneti was 625 miles away as the crow flies, but a lot farther as we ended up traveling. 
In an essay about the trip, Mark later captured the surreal flavor of our drive. We had been traveling Chad's only paved road for less than an hour when Piero suddenly veered off into the sand. I assumed we were stopping, but Piero just pointed the vehicle northeast and kept going for the next four days. <laughs> Sometimes we followed rutted tracks in the sand, while other times it seemed like we were driving across areas that had never seen a vehicle. In the softer sand, the only way we could maintain headway was to drive at 60 miles per hour, with the vehicle skimming precariously at the limit of control. When we stopped to camp at night, our chatty and mechanic would work on the vehicles, cleaning out air filters and sometimes replacing or repairing various engine parts. We put in long, grueling days of four-wheeling, sometimes going from sunup to sundown, seeing nothing but flat sand. The key was to spend as much time as possible in Piero's lead vehicle, because in the following vehicles you lived in a cloud of dust, which worked its way into every orifice of your body. It was the beginning of the chatty and winter, and the temperature hovered in the 90s during the day. In summer, Piero explained, it got up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh, that's a hot place that they're in right there. 140 I'm sweating at 85. I'm not going to lie to you guys right now. It's like 65 in my house right now, and I'm, I'm chilling. I wouldn't make it. I just wouldn't. That's probably why they didn't invite me, actually. That makes sense. The other guys tended to space out or try to sleep during this endless, monotonous journey, but I was transfixed. With my face glued to the window, I stared out at the emptiness, watching for any change in the horizon. On our second day in the sand, we had an encounter that turned into a minor epiphany for me. Suddenly, I saw two men riding camels in the desert ahead of us. Piero slowed down for them and stopped a short distance away. In retrospect, I wonder if he was stopping only because he was using, used to his tourists wanting to take pictures of such things, or if he was truly stopping out of courtesy to interact with them, the way hikers do when they're out in the backcountry. Regardless, we piled out of the jeeps and approached the nomads, one of whom dismounted and poured us a large bowl of camel milk. Piero explained that nomads will always offer you something as hospitality, even if they don't have much for themselves. We declined his offer, taking a few pictures instead. Piero gave the two men the leftovers from our breakfast, explaining to us that it was normal for them to travel for days without any real food. They mounted their camels and continued into the desert. Later I asked Piero how those nomads could navigate so accurately in the desert, especially when the stakes were so high. A slight mistake in bearing would mean missing the next well, and dying of dehydration in the middle of nowhere. Piero explained that they use the sun in the direction of the wind, which is constant in the winter, to navigate. When I protested that it seemed like too serious a situation to rely only on the sun and wind, Piero drew an analogy to climbing. Sometimes you find yourself in positions where falling would mean death, so you don't fall. It helped me understand. The nomads just don't make mistakes. Occasionally, when we passed a small oasis, we'd run into native people, small clusters of men, women, and children, living in mud huts or thatched dwellings. These were tobuus. Tobus? So unused to seeing strangers, especially white-skinned westerners, that Piero warned us not to approach them or take photographs of them. Still, I stared in fascination at these semi-nomadic desert dwellers, and here I had another, more lasting epiphany. After the trip was over, it wasn't, it wasn't the climbing that stuck foremost in my memory. It was the days of driving across the desert to and from the Aneti. My lasting impressions were of kids beating donkeys to make them haul water faster, or of men riding camels through the middle of nowhere, or of other men working all day to turn mud into bricks. I was seeing a completely different way of life from any I'd ever witnessed before, and in a completely alien place. The simple facts of chatty in life, what it takes to survive in that kind of climate with nothing but a hut and some animals, stunned me. And this made me realize, perhaps for the first time, how easy my life was compared to those of people in less privileged societies. That insight would lead me, a few years later, to redirect my goals towards something other than climbing. It took a while to sink in, but that was the epiphany. Toward the end of the fourth day, we spied some rocks in the distance. We hadn't seen so much as a hill since leaving N'Djamena. Anticipation ran high, all of us were thinking, will the rock be any good? When we got close enough, we piled out of the vehicles and literally ran over to the nearest formations. We knew from Piero that the pinnacles and arches were made of sandstone, but would it be the sharp, clean sandstone of Nevada's red rocks, or the chassis stuff like the Fisher Towers in Utah? To our dismay, we discovered that the sandstone in the Aneti ranged from terrible rock to a truly atrocious, indomitable rock. It was all bad. 
No matter what, however, the Anetti was a photographer's and filmmaker's paradise, and the media team got images and footage like you've never seen anywhere else in the world. Our first major objective was a 200-foot-tall spire that we called the Citadel. As Mark described it, the tower was shaped like a giant boxcar standing on end, featuring four distinct arrets, one of which appeared to have decent holes. A rotten overhang guarded the bottom, but sported a crack that looked doable. James Pearson was psyched to lead it. I thought it looked like a death route. He tied in and started up as Mark belayed with the media team in rapt attention. I didn't want to just sit around and watch someone else climb. I hadn't come halfway around the world and four days across the desert just to speculate. Spectate, excuse me. So I wandered off and started soloing up a nearby random tower. Before this trip, Tim, Jimmy, and Renan had seen me solo a little bit on solid rock, but Mark and James had never watched me solo at all. I think what I was doing now freaked them out a little bit. A characteristic Honold understatement. In his essay about the trip, Sinat wrote, I heard a noise behind me and saw Honold emerging ropeless from a Bombay chimney 40 feet up a nearby tower. Above him rose an overhanging fist crack into which he set some jams, then swung his feet out of the chimney. Flowing like a snake up the rock, he was soon mantling over the lip. He built a small cairn and then down soloed the tower via an overhanging face. On his way down, he broke off several hand and footholds, and I was barely able to watch. He later admitted that the down climb had been a little more than he, than he bargained for. I can't imagine soloing something that's never been climbed before. I can understand, well, I shouldn't say I can understand, but my brain can conceptualize soloing a route that has been climbed for years, but um, doing something that's never been climbed on before is significantly scarier. I recently had an experience very, very minutely similar to this uh, and nowhere near as dangerous, but when we were looking for um, some boulders out in the Culp Valley area to free solo. If you follow me on Instagram, you know I've been putting up a lot. Me and my friends, I should say, have been putting up a lot of climbs out in that area. And um, the first ascensionist thing, uh, one of the things that we look for is, you know, climbs that have never been done before and things that are going to break. And there was a really tall boulder that we found that was probably about 28 feet tall, probably a little less than that, 24, 25 feet tall, um, and a very sketchy landing, uh, tall enough to, to kill you if you take a bad fall. And we opted not to climb it, even though it was a cool line. Um, because what if you're 20 feet up and the jug you're on breaks and you hit the deck? You know what I mean? It's something that's never been climbed before. So it's just an extra step of caution you have to take. For someone like Alex Honnold, who's free soloing without a rope, you have nothing to catch you if something breaks that you trust. According to Sinat, Alex made some six solo first ascents of untouched routes during the time it took Pearson, climbing brilliantly, to get to the top of the citadel. I can just picture someone climbing like this, you know, obvious line, and then Alex Honnold in the background just scurrying like a cartoon from rock to rock free soloing. Interviewed after the team's return from Chad, Jimmy Chin reported that when Alex was soloing, it got so that we couldn't watch, and we also didn't want him to know we were watching because we didn't want to give him any extra motivation to push it. Several days after the Citadel climb, Alex started up, tied in, effectively top roping on a beautiful sandstone arch. In his article, Sinop played this exploit up as zany hijinks. We ended up one day sitting below a 100 foot tall arch with a 180 degree rainbow off width crack, splitting the underside of the formula formation. I had zero interest in climbing this heinous fissure, but Honnold was psyched. Ten feet off the ground, Honnold lunged for a basketball-sized hold that promptly exploded in his face, sending him winging across the arch. Once the route had spit him off, you could see in Honnold's face that it was game on. He jumped back on, and for more than an hour he battled his way up, across, and then down the other side of the off width. He shuffled across the horizontal section by hanging upside down by foot cams. That was the most disgusting route of my life, Honnold exclaimed, panting, his body covered in dust and bat piss, but with a huge grin on his face. He looked happier than I'd seen him all trip. If you're wondering what just happened, by the way, I'm, I'm spanking my cat. She loves to be spanked. You know how it is. Yet four years later, Sinat looked back on Alex's free soloing in Chad with lingering misgivings, verging on disapproval. In Chad, he says, Alex was cavalier about risk, overconfident. On that first tower, he was just doing what was just plain mind-numbing. As he downclimbed, he broke, three, broke loose three of his four holds, so he was dangling by one arm. What was that about, I asked him when he got down. He didn't answer. He wouldn't cop to it. As far as I can tell, Alex came very close to falling off in the Anetti. Yeah, I've heard those guys' comments, but only secondhand. 
I think one thing that freaked them a little was the assumption that if you're going to free solo, you should do it on routes you've climbed before, even carefully rehearsed so that there are no unwelcome surprises, as I had on Moonlight Buttress. To free solo rock that you've never touched before, a lot of it chassis and loose, might seem too out there. But what I was soloing in Chad wasn't that hard, maybe 5-7. As for breaking off holds as I downclimbed that first tower, Mark's got it wrong. Yes, it was an overhanging wall and I was hanging from two 5-5 five, five mud jugs. Both my footholds broke off, but it wasn't hard to hang on and I definitely wasn't dangling by one arm. On a route called Royal Arches in Yosemite, I once pulled off a big hold on a 5-5 five, five pitch I was soloing. My body swung backward, but I was able to grab the hold, shove it back in place, and recover. It was scary, but it was like magic. On 5-5, five, five, it's easy to have magic. On 5-11, it's not as magical. We climbed for 10 days in the Anetti. The poor quality of the sandstone meant that bolts, and for that matter, any of our gear wouldn't really hold, which added a lot to the adventure of the climbing. Mark and James had real fears about ripping off all the pro on a pitch, including the anchors. I found myself retreating off as many lines as I finished, though I didn't matter, though it didn't matter because as much because it's easier to bail when soloing. That seems totally opposite to me, but I guess I guess I get what he's saying. Gear-wise, it's easier to bail when soloing. You have no gear. In the end, as I mentioned, it wasn't the climbing that made the trip so memorable. It was having an adventure in a completely alien landscape and witnessing a way of life that would have been unimaginable to me beforehand. In Chad, I saw extreme poverty for the first time. It was hard for me to imagine living your whole life and never touching anything but sand. What we saw there were people surviving in a full-on Stone Age culture. My trip coincided with the time when my own life was getting easier thanks to sponsorship and recognition. Nowadays, I can film a two-day commercial and make more money than those people in Chad make in their whole lives. That's fucked up. And that discrepancy ultimately forced me to examine how I to live my own life and what I could do for others who were less fortunate. By the time Alex went to Chad in November 2010, he and Stacy were back together, but there would be subsequent breakups in their future. Looking back in 2014, Alex commented, I find it really hard to see six months into the future, let alone a year or more. Stacy complains that what makes it hard for us to talk about our future together. She wants to know where we might live, or whether she should continue to work as a nurse or just live with me on the road. We've talked about having children. I sort of joke that I'd like to have grandkids someday, but the thought of raising an infant seems heinous. It probably has something to do with my own childhood, but I don't really want to go there. It bugs Stacy when I joke about dying. I might say something like, you better appreciate me now because I may not be around very long. I'm just goofing around, but Stacy hates it. I know that she believes that I won't fall off soloing. She has faith in my ability and judgment. Some of our breakups got triggered by my feelings that I needed to be alone, that a relationship interfered with my climbing. When I told her that, she got really mad. She told me bluntly, Okay, it's over. Don't talk to me. Don't try. Don't even try to contact me. Then a few weeks or even months go by and I realize I miss Stacy. I'll get all sheepish and call her up. I know you didn't want me to contact you, I'll say, but could we meet just to talk? Maybe have lunch? She gives in because I insist that I've learned more about myself and have realized that Stacy does have a positive impact on my life, and after all, we really do love each other. In an unguarded moment, Alex admitted, I think Stacy has had a lot to do with humanizing me. What spurred that insight was a playback of 2014 of some comments that Alex made to this writer, David Roberts, in 2010. When I interviewed him for a, public, for a profile published in the May 2011 issue of Outside Magazine, an example, in 2010, Alex referred to having to go to North Carolina for the North Face appearance as a gong show. He added, I see all this stuff as media BS. An upcoming appearance as the featured speaker at the Banff Mountain Film Festival and Book Festival was full-on BS. I mean, it's okay, but it's time I can't spend climbing. You want this on the record? I asked. Why not? How are your Banff hosts going to react if they read that comment? Alex shrugged. I just say what I feel. Maybe it'll come back to bite me in the ass someday, and then I'll just stop talking to people. Other comments in 2010 sounded like nonchalant bragging. Yeah, said Alex. I crushed high school. I took a test once, and they said I was a genius. Yet others sounded like cruel put-downs, as when Alex dismissed one of America's leading female rock climbers as, quote, a bit of a puss, because she'd asked her partner to overprotect a scary traverse she was seconding. About this high-profile climber, Alex added dismissively, she hasn't done anything I couldn't do. Yikes, dude. 
In 2010, Chris Widener, one of Alex's best friends, complained, when we started climbing together, he was very polite, very safety conscious. Now he's more likely to badmouth you. About a year ago, I was trying to lead this pitch and I kept falling off. Alex said, dude, what's your fucking problem? It's only 513. He may have been joshing, but it hurt my feelings. He's got a certain attitude now, like unless you're a world-class climber, you suck. I finally said, hey, give me a break. I'm trying as hard as I can. He may have realized he was hurting my feelings, but he just doesn't want to deal with it. When I reminded Alex of those comments in 2014, he was abashed. That's not me anymore, he insisted. I think back, I think back then I was pretty aggro. I thought I had something to prove. By 2015, Alex Honnold evidently has, has little still to prove, yet his intensity shows no signs of ebbing. Something still drives him to a kind of perfection on rock, and recently on snow and ice, that goes beyond the frontiers established by his boldest predecessors. No matter what the difference in our styles and approaches, old school versus new school, mountaineer versus rock climber, Mark Sinat and I have always got along well. Today, I consider him like one of my mentors, as well as one of the teammates that I'm most indebted to. After Chad, I signed up for yet another Sinat trip sponsored by the North Face and Men's Journal. This time, in July 2011, we headed off for Devil's Bay on the south coast of Newfoundland, Newfoundland, where big granite cliffs rise straight out of the ocean. We hope to put up some good new routes there and document everything with camera and film. Two others of our gang from the Chad Expedition, James Pearson and Tim Kempel, were returning, and it was good to renew our friendship in Canada. The other three were Jim Surrett, Matt Irving, and Hazel Findlay. I'd climbed a bit here and there with Hazel and Matt, but I'd never met Jim so Mark spoke highly of him. Hazel is a really strong British chick who evolved from gym climbing, six times British junior champion in indoor competitions, to become a rare thing for women, a very strong trad climber on dangerous, very strong trad leader on dangerous run-out routes. Sender Film would make a beguiling film about her called Spice Girl, and I would later climb with Hazel in South Africa for another film called Africa Fusion, released in 2015. Highly recommend if you don't know who uh, Hazel Finlay is, by the way, to check her out. She is a badass, certified by me. The only problem with the Newfoundland expedition was that the weather didn't cooperate. It turned out to be a miserable washout. To kill the downtime, I jotted down notes almost like I was writing a diary. Some entries. It's been raining on and off for 10 days, and everything in my small tent is getting a little damp. Though I'm the lucky one on the trip. Everyone else on the team had their tents either destroyed or damaged in last night's freakishly strong windstorm. So far, we've climbed one route and sat in the rain and brooded. Well, to be honest, I'm brooding and everyone else is drinking a lot and making the best of it. Before coming on this trip, I felt like I was in great shape, climbing my first traditional 8B plus 514A and a few other hard sport routes. I was fresh off a good season in Yosemite in which I'd soloed some things I was proud of. Things should have been going great for me, and yet all I could think about while I festered in my damp tent was that my fitness was slipping away and that I was wasting my time. I could be anywhere else in the world climbing every day. Instead, here I was, in a tent, in the rain, depressed out of my mind. I try to make the best of it and go for hikes despite the content, constant rain, just because the landscape is so beautiful. But then days of whiteout fog descend and it seems too dangerous to go wandering away from camp. I'm locked in my tent with nothing to do but read and do push-ups. We spend most of the time in the communal mess tent telling stories and bantering. Not that there's anything in particular to say after a week of rain, yet Mark has a distinctly entertaining way of telling stories, even if I have heard them all at least twice before. In many ways, our trip to Newfoundland is what people who work normal jobs do for vacation, go somewhere exotic with a group of friends and then hang out all day eating and drinking. Several years later, looking back on our Newfoundland trip, Mark insisted that the expedition had been a success. He thought that we'd made a good short film by making raininess the central theme. It was tilted tent bound in Devil's Bay. Mark told me that other people Mark told other people that the rest of the guys had a running joke about me, that I would just sit in the group tent, muttering, This is the grimmest place on earth. Mark even called me a sort of Debbie Downer, almost a whiner. He thought I damaged the group's morale. He also thought that a route the team free climbed called Leviathan was awesome. Well, sorry Mark, but that's not how I remember Devil's Bay. Tentbound is a horrible little film, because the guys didn't have anything to work with. There was no story. James Pearson and I free-climbed a route called Lucifer's Lighthouse, which was the hardest thing on the wall, but the whole trip was grim. Not just because of the rain. If you were in Patagonia, it'd be worth waiting out the weather, just to get a chance to climb on some of the most epic peaks on Earth. But I'd just come from the valley, and I was losing my fitness day after day. And this place sucked. 
Wet, slabby granite, not featured, not that tall. Worse than the stuff in Tuolumne. I could have been doing this kind of climbing in Tuolumne and eating pizza every afternoon. Newfoundland just wasn't rad. It wasn't the future. As for me being Debbie Downer, well, that's not entirely fair. Everybody was bummed and bored. I went on hikes, but then we'd get those impossible whiteouts. You could get lost in the fog. It was hard to find the latrine a hundred feet from camp. I was, I'll admit, the most vocal member of our crew, saying early on, we should just leave. But I don't hold any of this against Mark. Every trip I've gone on with him has been a life experience. I always learn something. Between my trips to Chad and Newfoundland in the winter of 2010 and 11, I embarked on what I half-jokingly called my sport climbing tour of the antiquities. From Africa, I went straight to Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me, Israel. Then Jordan. Then Turkey. Then Greece. In Israel and Jordan, I stayed with a friend. Stacy joined me for Turkey and Greece. It wasn't a true tourist vacation. I did all the hardest routes in Israel and all the hardest routes at uh, Gayak Bayiri, Gayak Bayiri in Turkey, and in Kalmnos in Greece, where the climbing is terrific. I got shut down somewhat because it rained so much the limestone cliffs were seeping. As for the antiquities, I actually read some books about the histories of the countries where I was climbing. I did all kinds of cultural stuff, got a pretty legit taste of the past, saw a lot of old things, saw a lot of people in funny dress. A trip like that serves as a kind of filler in between real climbing adventures. I traveled, climbed, tried new things, learned new stuff, all while I was preparing for something big. 2011, like 2009, was what I call a year of cons consolidation. In Alex Lothar's profile of me for Alpinist, summer 2011, he writes about the pressure on me to keep upping the ante. He paraphrases the public's response to my big free solos. What's next? Give us more. And he adds, expectations can be dangerous, and they only become more so when, you are f when what you're famous for is risking your life. If he's not careful, we could admire Alex Honnold to death. That's a fair concern, but it's not like I haven't dealt with this pressure ever since folks started noticing what I was doing. The pressure only nudges me if it's about what I project, if it's about a project I want to do anyway. Actually, a bigger motivator than any media attention would be a hot chick at the base of a wall who I could impress. Though she probably couldn't tell the difference between 5.10 and 5.13. But no matter how hot the chick is, say if I was standing at the base of El Cap and she urged me to free solo some route, my answer would be, no way. For example, I can't tell you how many people over the years have pressured me to drink alcohol. We'll be at a party and somebody will taunt me. Alex, just try this beer. It's not going to hurt you. Just take a sip. I've never given in. Booze doesn't interest me. Most of the media attention that has come my way so far has been focused on my free solos. That's not the only kind of climbing that compels me. Just as rad in my book are the big wall link-ups I've attempted, especially in Yosemite. And 2012 would be another watershed year for me as I, as I went after speed climbs on the big walls and link-ups, both with partners and solo, of some of the most epic routes in North America. And that is the end of chapter four. We are in chapter five. We are approaching halfway through the book. We still have a little way to go. We're probably about a, a third of the way through. Hope you guys are enjoying so much. Um, I will see you guys next week uh, for the beginning of chapter five. Thanks for watching or listening and bye.